books and online and other places. Um, and I was having a, a real tough time deciding who to introduce first. So they helped me. <laughs> and, and our guests have volunteered Patricia Briggs to go first. <laughs> when I turn it on. How fun. You can tell I write fantasy, not science fiction, right? <laughs> That's what you get when you're late. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'd like to tell you a story. Uh, once upon a time, and it was me. I can tell you that much. Uh, once upon a time, there was a kid. Uh, I don't remember not loving horses. And trust me, I get to the point. It's okay. Uh, I really, Mike, it's, where's my husband? Mike, it's okay, I will get to a point eventually. Um, but I don't remember not loving horses. And I, I, I know that it predated kindergarten because I have like pieces that my mom saved of me drawing horses on pieces of paper and, and sticking them up on the wall and that kind of thing. And I know that my dad used to complain because whenever they went on a trip to visit his folks or my, or my mother's folks, I would make them stop. Um, so that I could go and pet a sheep or a cow or every horse along the road. <laughs> and, uh, but we lived in the city. It wasn't a big city. It was Butte, Montana. Um, so there was an, some, some chance that I had friends that might have horses. But we lived in the city. And my folks were not really wealthy people. My dad was a horse ranger. My mom was a librarian. And uh, so I, there was no way I could, get, I could have a horse. And so I found a different way to find to have a horse. And I would go to the library with my older sister, and she would go and get whatever she got. And I would go into the kids' library, and I would pick up um, C.W. Anderson's Billy and Blaze books. Um, I would pick up there's Tiz a Pony um, books. There was, and then and the older kids' books were the Black Stallion books, which I collected. Even I, I I checked out like five of them before I could read because I like to sit there and look through the pictures and tell stories about the pictures in the book. I don't ever remember not doing that. I don't ever remember books not being important to me. Um, and when I had a book in my hand, then I could ride horses, and I could groom horses, and I could, I could clean stalls. I know that's weird to most people, but if you're a pod person around horses, you enjoy cleaning stalls, right? Uh, and all of these things that I could do um, without actually being able to um, have the horse myself. And being a kid, you don't have the power to do that. So I had the power to read, and that's what I did. And gradually it occurred to me that I could do other things too. I could fly planes, I could um, travel in a spaceship. When I was in fifth or sixth grade, I was homesick, and my sister gave me one of her Andre Norton books, Beastmaster, because she said it had a horse in it. <laughs> and it was awesome. It was wonderful and it opened this whole new world of science fiction and fantasy. And it wasn't until sixth grade I started reading other things. And books have influenced me my whole life and I never recognized how much they had done so until um, when my own kids were uh, like ages 8 to 14 and we would sit down and read books and I, I grabbed my old Black Beauty book and I said, okay kids, you got your choice the last time. I get to read you something I like. <laughs> And I opened it up and I didn't realize, I remember reading it a lot when I was a kid, but I didn't realize how big chunks of it I had memorized. And some of them you know, were important moments in the book, like, like you know, pick your feet up well when you trot, never bite your kick even in play, which is really good advice if you're a horse. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, also just weird things like, like uh, the doctor was a heavier man than John, but not nearly so good a writer. And as I was reading these to my kids, I'm like, this is really freaking weird that I do this. But I also recognize that a lot of the, a lot of the baseline morality that I've had my whole life was based on this book. That, that, that whole, you know, pick your feet up while on your trot is just, if you're going to do something, do it well. Um, uh, the, idea that, the idea that you need to stick up for other people. And that if you watch terrible things happen and you don't say anything, you're as guilty as the people who are doing the terrible things. And that ignorance is no excuse. You know, things like that that have just have surrounded me my whole life. And it taught me how powerful words are and how powerful books are. When 9-11 happened, um, and I've talked to a lot of my friends who are writers about that time, uh, we were all just stunned. And because we write fiction, we felt utterly useless. 
You know, it's not like we were going building anything. It's not like we were going to do anything. It just, it was like all of the things that we have done our whole life were just useless. And, you know, it wasn't just me. It was, it was um, I belonged to a big writer's group at the time. Uh, we didn't live there anymore, but Eugene has, a Eugene, Oregon has a huge writer's group called Wordos. And they're incredibly influential. And uh, lots and lots of people come out of Wordos and go on and win the, oh, uh, <coughs> sorry, Writers of the Future Award, uh, for instance. Um, and I think they have more Nebulas, Hugos, and uh, uh, Stoker Awards in combination than any other writers group in the United States, except for the one that Connie Willis writes with. <laughs> because Connie Willis by herself has done it more than all of them. But, um, right, okay. Uh, so, uh, so I was talking to them about that, because we, we talked a lot on, on our, our writers uh, round table thing that we had going on the internet. Uh, about how useless we felt. And about the next day, I stopped and I thought, and I was watching, I was watching people who should know better, people who had just been devastated by this, this terrible act of hatred, a blind hatred, not for the people that worked in the World Trade Center, because they didn't know, you know, Tom Jones, who, who uh, was the janitor in the basement. They didn't know Sally, who was the receptionist in, in one of the many banks in, in the building. They didn't know those people. They just hated them blindly because they were American capitalists. And I heard, after seeing something like that, I heard people in the street talking about towel heads and all this stuff, and, and, and I'm going, don't they recognize that's exactly the same thing that caused um, the World Trade Center? This blind hatred for somebody you don't know. And I started thinking about how to solve that, because I'm a history major, you know, I'm not, I'm not I don't have a, I don't have a PhD like David over here, but I'm a history major, and uh, because I'm also a double major in German, don't ask me to speak German. It's been 35 years, and I couldn't speak it then. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, of course, the, the area of history that I studied a lot was Nazi Germany, and um, it's it's it how do you do prevent something like that happening when when Nazi Germany happened? Germany was the most advanced culturally and scientifically and literaturally and any other kind of culture you want to talk about. Germany was the most advanced nation in the world. And look what happened to them, that they created this total terrible, terrible um, thing that they did and they should have known better. So how do you teach people if education doesn't do it? And it occurred to me that we fiction writers, and we nonfiction writers too, that's our job. Our job is to take the little girl who can't have a horse and say, this is what it's like to have a horse. So when you're 21 and you're old enough and you can afford a horse, you already know how to take care of it. Or um, if, you, um, if you meet somebody who is uh, Pakistani on the street, you know something about being Pakistani or Jewish or black or Native American or different than you, richer, poorer, different culture, different whatever, and you're not afraid of them because you understand them, because you walked a mile in their moccasins, because you've read somebody's really good book. And that, to me, is what books are all about, is to, to take us and make us, not one person, not like that, but, but make us see everybody as a real person and not just a towel head, not just a, you know, not just, I don't know, I'm not gonna use those expletives, but you know what I'm talking about. And for me, that makes books really, really cool. And it makes our job, not just our job here, but your job there as readers and writers, very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Neither did I. And my husband said, Had you written, have you written your speech yet? And I said, no, I'll just fly. And it worked. So <laughs> The trick is to stop before I start babbling. <laughs> is that what happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, next, I would like to ask uh, our science fiction author, screenwriter, 